Hello and welcome to the ninth episode of Chicago Dialogues. Uh, this series of dialogues is being produced by the University of Chicago Center in Delhi in collaboration with Prohor.in. Mr. Abhikshanda serves as the curator of this series. I am Deepesh Chakraborty. I am currently the faculty director of the center in Delhi. And I teach history and South Asian languages and civilizations at the University of Chicago. It is uh, a matter of tremendous honor and pleasure for us that we present to you um, our esteemed colleague, Professor Martha Nussbaum, um, from the law school and the classics department and the political science department. Um, in conversation with three very distinguished um, Indian scholars, uh, uh, whom I'll introduce soon. And uh, the conversation will focus on Professor Nussbaum's uh, most recent book, uh, uh, soon to be published by Norton. Uh, and it's called Citadels of Pride, Sexual Assault, Accountability, and reconciliation. Professor Nussbaum is one of my most celebrated and distinguished and deservedly decorated colleagues. I mean, it could take up the entire hour if I had to describe her achievements and accomplishments in detail. Um, suffice it to say that she's the author of many remarkable publications. Um, she has had honorary doctorates for, from more than 60 universities from around the world and the winner of many prizes, the most recent ones in the last few years being um, the Kyoto Prize in Arts and Philosophy 2016, the Don Randall Prize for Achievement in the Humanities from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences 2018, uh, the Berguin Prize for Philosophy and Culture 2018, and the very prestigious Holberg Prize that was announced uh, this year, earlier this year. In conversation with her, we have three very distinguished scholars from uh, India or who've worked on India. So I have Professor Tanika Sarkar, a preeminent feminist historian and a professor emerita of history from Jawaharlal, of Jawaharlal Nehru University, the author of many books and the winner of uh, the Tagore Memorial Prize uh, in 2004, uh, which actually I think she returned uh, in protest over the police firing in Nandigram in March, 2007. She has been a visiting professor in many institutions in the UK and the USA and elsewhere, uh, including this university, the University of Chicago. Professor Jayati Ghosh taught economics at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, for near 30, nearly 35 years, and in January 2021, she joined the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She has authored or edited 19 books, uh, the, one of the most recent ones being on demonetize, called Demonetization Decoded that came out in 2017, and another called Women Workers in the Informal Economy is forthcoming with with Routledge, she's also the winner of many prizes and awards. And we also have Professor Zoya Hassan, uh, who is Professor Emerita of Political Science, uh, Jawaharlal, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. So all three of uh, our Indian scholars present today have been associated with JNU, uh, where Professor Hassan was also the Dean of the School of Social Sciences. Among her many books, uh, is uh, Indians li India's Living Constitution, Ideas, Practices, Controversies. Um, she also edited uh, with the late Mushirul Hassan a book called India Social Development Report, 2012 Minorities at the Margin. Um, Professor Hassan had also been a visitor at many institutions, uh, including here. So what is wonderful about the gathering today is that uh, Professor Nussbaum has had a long-standing interest in India 
and we are delighted to bring to you a conversation that brings her American and interest, American interest and Indian interest together. Uh, and we are also very honored that these three very distinguished Indian scholars agreed to participate in this episode. So welcome to you all and over to Professor Nussbaum and our guests. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deepesh. I'm so happy to be here in conversation with these three uh, amazing scholars. I have worked with them before and they're friends. And so it's also just great to see you all again. And I'm so honored that the three of you have agreed to talk about this new book. So let me just spend about 10 minutes talking about the motivation behind the book and go through a little what it tries to do. Really, I was working on a different book, which I'm still working on, when the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings for the Supreme Court took place. Uh, if you have followed that at all, it was a case where he was accused of having committed sexual assault long ago in his high school days. And he denied it and the woman came forward and she was publicly humiliated and given a very bad treatment. So anyway, in the process, it became clear to me, first of all, that the Me Too movement has not been the solution that many people think it is, um, but also that it is very important to really get clear about what, what has been going on behind the scenes. There has been a lot of change and progress in the law that people don't know much about. And I found that the public in talking about the Kavanaugh case wasn't even clear about the difference between sexual assault, which in the US is a criminal offense dealt with largely by state laws, each state having its own different laws, and sexual harassment, which is a civil offense under federal law of discrimination. So I just thought spelling these things out, getting clear about the progress that had occurred. But then of course, since I am a philosopher and philosophy is my other, besides the law school, my other major department, trying to delve deeper as a philosopher and to try to get at what is behind the resistance of mainly men to shaping up and, and treating women with more equal respect, and then identifying some of the remaining zones where there is very little progress. So in the first section of the book, I go back to some earlier work of mine and talk about the feminist concept of objectification, treating what's really a person as a mere thing. This is a pervasive fact in social life, not only in gender, but of course also in racial relations and other class relations. But I focused on objectification of women by men and talked about what, what it is really to treat a person as a thing. It involves denial of autonomy, denial of full individuality, but above all, a kind of instrumentalization. This is a, a, a tool of my purposes. It's something about me, not about that person. So it's a failure to actually give equal respect to that person. But what could lie behind that? Why would people do that? If you're living with a person or if you run into a person in the workplace, why would you treat her as a mere thing? So then I argue that the vice that Dante calls the vice of pride is what's really behind this, a kind of narcissism where the person thinks I'm the one who counts. Other people don't count except as servants of my interests. Dante depicts the proud as bent over themselves in purgatory so that they can't even see the outside world. They're just bent like hoops looking only at themselves. And I think a lot of people go through the world that way. Pride can be only in one area. You could have race pride without having gender pride and you could have class pride without having race pride and so forth. But gender pride seems to be pretty ubiquitous in American society where for so long men have learned to believe that women are there for their use, whether as sexual objects or as helpmates in the house uh, or whatever. So, so that is the, the second chapter. Then I turn to the side of victims because I have long been a critic of retributive anger and I'm distressed by some of the retributive attitudes that I see in the Me Too movement, which I think do not help social progress. So, so I talk about how victim anger, which may seem strong and progressive. It's strong insofar as it confronts injustice and demands change. 
and faces forward. But insofar as it spends all its time trying to get back at what's already happened, I, I argue that that's not so productive. What we need to do is to get together and make things better in the future. <clears throat> but then I turn to law, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what my Indian colleagues have to say about this, because American feminists, it just happens, and I, I always assumed it was universal, but now I know it isn't, have made a great deal of progress through law and being lawyers. I actually sought out teaching in a law school, and I teach feminist philosophy in, in our law school, because I was aware that law students are gonna be lawyers and that that's an area where women have made huge progress in our society. So first I talk about the criminal law of sexual assault, where by 1970, it was still the case that you couldn't win a, a rape case unless you showed that you had put up spectacular resistance, almost fighting to the death. But of course that was stupid and futile and people were advised not to do that but the law had not adjusted to the reality. By now, however, through not through celebrities coming forward as in the Me Too movement, but by working women, little known women who just went to lawyers and tried to press their case, we have changes of a very good kind, whereby now just saying no is sufficient. So no means no. But even that, most people agree is not quite enough because you might not say no because you're too scared or you're too intimidated. So the real cutting edge of rape law reform right now is in trying to demand affirmative consent as part of what makes a sex act legal. So, so that's that chapter. But then I turn to sexual harassment, which in our country came through a very different route. Of course, some sexual offenses in the workplace are also sexual assault, but sexual harassment can be present without there being any actual assault through a kind of pervasive denigration and objectification in the workplace. And the way that happened really was that the feminist lawyer, Catherine McKinnon, just said, well, we have this anti-discrimination law, Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, that is a general anti-discrimination law, but people have not yet realized that sexual harassment in the workplace is a form of sex discrimination. So she wrote this extremely important book, Sexual Harassment of Working Women. And then eventually she and her allies who included very prominently African-American lawyers uh, and Pauli Murray, a great African-American lawyer was a leader in this, convinced Congress to really go there and, and say that that was covered under the Civil Rights Act. But then the courts had to come into it and they had to agree and that was a long evolution, but by now we have two forms of sexual harassment that are recognized as crimes under sexual harassment law. What's called quid pro quo, where you're asked, sleep with me or I'll fire you. Or what's more uh, common actually, and more I think more important, hostile environment, where you, you know, you're not demanded a specific thing, but the whole atmosphere is very hostile to you as a woman. And so I go through the history of that and, and talk about why it's failed in some famous cases like the Anita Hill case and what needs to be done to make that work better. But then in the last section, I turn to some areas of mostly US. I mean, I, I'm eager to hear what, what my Indian colleagues have to say that resist reform, or which I call citadels of pride, then have walled themselves around and they have not, they have resisted change. Now, the reason I think that usually happens is that certain famous people are making a lot of money for other people and the other people shield them from the demands of the law. The first area I look at is one that maybe the Indian audience may not know so much about, our federal judiciary, where at the high level of the appellate courts, people, the judges have clerks, who work for them usually for a year, sometimes two years. And the clerks are bound by a strict code of confidentiality, which was taken in the past to mean they couldn't blow the whistle on sexual offenses in, in the judge's chambers. So these clerks who were totally at the power of the judge were bound by this code of silence or they, they thought they were. And th there are some really bad judges that abuse this freedom. And so I talk about how hard it is, given 
their, their high status. And given the fact that there are powerful interests in the business world in particular that have a stake on keeping those people on as judges because they expect them to rule a certain way in their favor, those people were insulated from reform. There's been uh, some reform by now. Ju Chief Justice Roberts has favored reform and at least the clerks now know that they can blow the whistle without reprisals. But things are still very bad because of this asymmetrical power structure. The next area is the area of the arts. And this is much more international where the performing arts are a very bad area for, for sexual pride because people just uh, have, a, people who have a lot of power have power over everyone. In a normal workplace, like a university, let's say, there can be a code that binds everyone. And since people are there for a long time, they have to know the rules and they have to abide by the rules. But the, in the performing arts, people move around and each employment lasts a relatively short time. So big people like Harvey Weinstein have power over everyone. So I discuss the problems in that area, focusing on classical music because that's the area I know best. But of course it applies in film and theater too. And finally, I look at the world of sports. In the US, we have this anomalous situation where young football and basketball players are trained in universities. This doesn't happen any other place in the world and it should not happen. It doesn't happen in American baseball either, which I think is much better. In baseball, like in European uh, soccer and, and basketball, there are minor leagues that are funded by the professional leagues and people get their training there. But in America, the universities pretend that these people are students. Of course, they cut them lots of breaks in their classwork and there's a lot of academic corruption, but then they have limitless license to assault women because if they've been even indicted for a criminal offense, they're not allowed to play. So this system, I try to unmask the finances of this system. It's funded by outside investors who form slightly shady tax dodge investment groups. And so the question is, how can that be reformed? Well, I stay here and I have Adam Silver, the commissioner of the ABA, the NBA, as a, a blurber of my book. He, he, uh, I agree with proposals that he had made before, namely that we have to just eliminate division one college football and college basketball and go over to a system more like baseball where there are minor leagues, which the NBA has been doing very successfully using European leagues, but using also their own minor league. Football has not tried to do this. And I think football is a real problem, but I don't know that that's what this particular audience wants to talk about most. But anyway, I, I try to give vivid examples of how the system resists reform. And then I draw some conclusions about how we can move forward. And, and I think it's important to move forward in a spirit of constructive work I, I favor law rather than the public shaming that comes with the Me Too movement, because wherever we can have due process and rules that apply to everyone, I think we should do that. When a person comes forward, I think it's important for the accused not to be blackballed without due process. So, so I talk about that. But anyway, I think I would rather stop at present and turn it over to my, my very eminent commentators. Thank you, uh, Martha. It's a great pleasure and privilege, I think, to participate uh, in this uh, panel discussion on Martha's new book, Citadels of Pride. Uh, this is a brilliant and splendid book. Uh, and I, what I found most interesting in the book were the numerous case studies uh, that uh, Martha has uh, uh, marshaled. Now, this book examines the intersection of what Martha calls toxic male pride and the culture of sexual violence and sexual harassment in America and the institutional and structural solutions uh, necessary to reform it. I think that is really uh, a standout aspect of the book is its focus on uh, the way uh, forward. Now, Martha shows how toxic masculinity infects three citadels of pride, the judiciary, the arts and sports. Uh, she explores the concept of objectification and the harms it causes and how male pride fuels the denial of women's autonomy and subjectivity that Martha just uh, mentioned in her opening remarks. 
<clears throat> she offers a damning indictment of the culture of male power and male privilege that insulates high profile abusers uh, from accountability and how that influences, uh, how that helps them to actually get away. Uh, in the end, I think she argues that the law, when applied correctly, can provide justice that seeks reconciliation and a shared future for men and women. Now, what is most striking is the progress uh, America has made in the unfinished revolution of sexual equality, uh, as Martha describes it. Uh, American women, she argues, have been able to turn to the law. And she again mentioned it uh, a little while ago. Uh, American women have been able to turn to the law and to legal change in a way that has not happened in other nations or in many other countries uh, across the world. Now, the idea of pride and greed as a central explanatory factor is undoubtedly significant. <clears throat> but does it hold the same explanatory value outside the three domains of uh, the judiciary, the arts, and sports? Uh, and does it have the same does it have the same value outside of celebrity cases that Martha uh, discusses? I think this is a question that we need to uh, consider. More importantly, uh, uh, speaking from an Indian uh, uh, context, uh, can male pride explain sexual violence more generally? In India, clearly, the sources of sexual assault and sexual violence are diverse and different from the US. It is uh, the idea of male pride uh, is certainly relevant for uh, some cases and uh, celebrity cases in particular. And the most recent uh, Delhi court's acquittal of journalist Priya Ramani uh, in a criminal defamation case brought against her by a very high profile editor uh, turned politician and former uh, union minister who had sued Ramani for speaking up, accusing her of tarnishing his, with quote, stellar reputation. Now, that's clearly a prominent example of male pride uh, going too far. But significantly, this case went on for uh, um, went on for a long time, and eventually, the court. Uh, court ruled in favor of uh, Priya Ramani, and the court said the right of reputation, and this is really significant, the right of reputation cannot be protected at the cost of the right of life and dignity as guaranteed under Article 21 of the Constitution. This was clearly an extraordinary uh, judgment. It was a very empowering judgment. In fact, it's probably a landmark in India's uh, Me Too movement, which is all but dead, uh, so to speak, until uh, this uh, verdict. But that said, in India, it has been much harder to call impunity to account. That's the big problem. In the entertainment industry, many women during the Me Too uh, uh, movement uh, complained uh, of uh, sexual harassment, but uh, most of them, faced a backlash uh, for speaking up, while the men who were accused of grievous abuse by them were reinstated, and they, didn't, they were not hurt in any way, leave alone being held to account uh, for their excesses. The allegations uh, against the former Chief Justice of India is, is well known, uh, and that was in the that has been in the news. So the allegations against the former Chief Justice of India were disposed of without uh, due process. So much so that he has been rewarded with uh, with the Rajya Sabha uh, membership. So much of what can be said about how powerful men that you talk about uh, get away. But going beyond uh, these cases, clearly the political and economic context is the key. <clears throat> to understanding sexual violence in India, which is so widespread, and the impunity for such crimes. Uh, violence against women, I mean, 
there are several, uh, I mean, there are several features of it, but let me just uh, briefly mention three that reflect the manner in which impunity operates, invisibilizes violence, uh, sexual violence, and the problems faced by women and women's groups and the women's movement in challenging this uh, violence. First is, of course, the home, where violence is enacted in the sphere of the family. Second, the streets and fields, where caste and class power provide impunity to the perpetrators. And third, in villages and regions where communal and caste violence, uh, targeted violence often, have been enacted, often with administrative and state complicity. And the, the third aspect that I just mentioned is particularly evident in the borderland uh, states. And Uma Chakravarti, in a fine lecture that she gave about uh, two years ago um, for the Jubilee of the Journal of Social Change, uh, spoke at great length about the impunity uh, in, in the border states of India where the army and various other institutions are literally, uh, you know, uh, I mean, can get away. Now, to Martha's point about the progress of law, which is what really uh, should concern us uh, as, uh, I mean, concern us in India. Now, India has made very significant changes to its rape laws in recent years, including uh, expanding the definition of rape to include something like what Martha was talking about, that no must mean uh, no, including expanding the definition of rape to include that the absence of a physical struggle does not equate or equal to consent. Uh, there are other redefinitions of rape that I won't get into, which are also uh, significant. Mm. However, many of the amendments to the criminal law made after the infamous uh, Delhi gang rape case in 2013, otherwise known as the Nirbhaya case, have yet to be implemented. In particular, uh, the uh, recommendations uh, of, uh, for systemic and procedural reforms, including what is most urgently needed are police reforms, reforms in the management of sexual violence cases, and educational reforms aimed at preventing sexual violence have just not proceeded. As is well known, the Indian court system is agonizingly slow, in part because of a shortage of judges. I don't have the figure right here, but uh, I just uh, today read a comparison between the number of judges per million in China and in India. I mean, it's like world apart. I mean, the, the, the judge, judges in India per, per million population is so much smaller than, for example, in uh, China. Not surprisingly, there are very few convictions. But, but apart from this, uh, and I uh, expect that Joyati and Tanika would be uh, talking about it with much greater authority uh, than me, and that is that the uh, low status of women is clearly the most important reason for underreporting and failure to get justice. So the biggest issue is women's lower status in our society, low work participation rate, and most importantly, fewer women in politics and government are major impediments to equality and justice. The contrast with the United States couldn't be greater, particularly after the Biden administration has taken over and the number of women that have been appointed by Joe Biden to very significant positions is something that is sort of unthinkable in India for decades to come. So the barriers uh, uh, the barriers to justice for survivors of sexual violence are immense. Survivors bringing forward cases where the accused are from a powerful background, face pressure from law enforcement officers and even the judiciary uh, to drop their case. Sometimes the judiciary and quite recently, um, uh, the, uh, sometimes the uh, judges even ask, uh, ask the complainant whether they are willing to marry uh, the uh, 
uh, the person who has uh, committed uh, committed the sexual crime against them. So when there's outrage at that, then they try to you know sort of step back from it. But this has happened, and as I said, as recently as about maybe a couple of months back. So obviously, this makes it very difficult to uh, difficult for women. <clears throat> especially from modest uh, backgrounds, uh, to take forward their case through the judicial system, which clearly contributes to the country's low, very pathetically low uh, conviction rates. Uh, and which is why, uh, you know, and as and when conviction does take place, there's this huge uh, hue and cry that the person has to be hanged. Uh, capital punishment, that seems to be the, uh, in India, that seems to be the preferred uh, solution. Uh, which obviously it is not. So these challenges then are often magnified if the survivors are from marginalized communities, particularly Dalits, Adivasis, and Muslims, who are so often the victims of sexual violence by powerful uh, men. Now, Indian democracy, it should be uh, clear, uh, doesn't, alas, I should say, alas, Indian democracy, such as it is today, doesn't protect autonomy by giving people opportunities to choose for themselves in key areas such as religion, spe free, uh, speech, political opinion, occupation, association, sex, and marriage. Leave alone uh, providing autonomy and subjectivity to women that Martha so eloquently uh, discusses in a fascinating book, except to those who belong to the privileged classes. Thank you. Lovely to see you, Martha, after all this while. And thank you for uh, having me on this panel. It's an enormous privilege and honor, and I don't really think that I deserve it. Uh, there's so much in this remarkable book. You have identified so many sites of discrimination, objectification, denigration, and given a history of how they came to be addressed by feminist and legal struggles. It's a great pleasure, it was a great pleasure reading it too, as you deftly move from legal philosophy to everyday lives, from Greek tragedy to gender politics. And above all, I found the text gentle, compassionate, always striving for fairness and justice and reconciliation in a way which to me was deeply healing. It made me understand a great deal about forms and sources of gender injustice and inequality, not just in the United States, about which I know quite little, but also in my own country. Now, Zoya has given us a very comprehensive uh, account of the Indian situation, and I'll probably repeat a few things she said, but in a slightly different form. Let me begin with some divergences and convergences between Indian and US experiences. The notion of workplace sexual harassment, which Martha uh, historicizes, I think developed relatively late in India, first in 1997 and then in 2013. Nor did, I think, Me Too lead to any signal achievements here, apart from the prominent and well-publicized case that Zoya has referred to. Nevertheless, I think Indian feminists should uh, attend very closely to Martha's warnings against what she so uh, you know, eloquently calls retributive fantasies that Me Too has unleashed. The movement was certainly very important for it uncovered a whole new range of workplace discriminations and trauma. But it also raises a serious dilemma about what should constitute evidence in such cases. The victim's words alone, in case, just in case it is mischievous or an exaggerated charge, then who protects the man whose reputation is in tatters? On the other hand, very often we do have to rely on the woman's word uh, for abuse rarely happens in front of witnesses. So that's a real dilemma. And then I don't know how to uh, articulate this clearly, but very often women's accumulated experiences and knowledge about humiliation and abuse 
come pouring out even when we are discussing, let's say, relatively minor offenses, an inappropriate word or gesture or look, which then, in the retributive heat, so to speak, appear indistinguishable uh, from the really gross forms of abuse. And also Me Too focused on naming and shaming individuals, important definitely, but that may tend to become an end in itself. It may individuate guilt rather than a whole system of values which underpins sexual misconduct. So, you know, why do men, you know, behave the way they do, which Martha's book uh, discusses and analyzes, that might kind of be lost sight of. What Indian and uh, US experiences have in common is above all the long, intense, and very difficult struggles of several generations of social scientists. But it seems that there's a recurrent reappearance of the same lot of abusers across generations. And what accounts for that? And more or less repeating, but in a different way, I cite three intercutting sources of gender abuse, inequality, objectification for India. First and foremost, I would say deeply entrenched religious norms, social morality, and familial pressure, which normalize inequality and objectification. Second, state power. Third, dominant political forces. Now, both state power and political forces are generally uh, mortgaged to social ideologies about gender. But ironically, at the same time, they are also our most important resources for positive change, and hence the Janus faced role of state laws. As Zoya said, over several years, several judges have advised rapists to marry their victims to save their honor. Uh, the verdicts are embedded in a social common sense that rape is the woman's shame, not the male rapists. Moreover, the lost honor can be salvaged if she is condemned to lifelong control of the man who has violated her. Now, this, this doesn't appear out of the blue. It is part of a notion of the woman's chastity and honor which can be rectified by marriage even to the rapist. Several courts argued in the Mathura rape case in the late 1970s that if a woman has a boyfriend, then she is definitionally, definitionally immoral. And such women are not victims of rape, they invite rape. Even a prominent woman activist from a leftist party once infamously said that prostitutes cannot be raped. Given these deeply entrenched perspectives about the purity of the female body uh, <clears throat> and purity of conduct, much legal change has remained on paper. So much so that a lot of our feminists argue that we need not think in terms of law at all. I do not agree completely. Sure, law cannot offer or has not offered, unlike the US, a complete or even substantive redressal. But if we do not have at least some of our, our laws, there will be a set of highly misogynist laws to replace them. So we need always to fight a rear guard battle. How is state power an impediment to gender justice? Zoya talked about uh, complicity. I would talk about the... Uh, <clears throat> active sexual abuse by forces of law and order, rape by policemen inside police stations or even on public roads are very frequent. They are a very common sight of the most grotesque forms of sexual abuse of women. Since the police are custodians of order, they easily recast the evidence to suit themselves. And uh, to go back to the Mathura rape case, uh, <clears throat> a young girl was raped within the police station and the police said that she did not, uh, you know, sh no one could hear her screaming or, uh, you know, opposing the rape. So 
she might must have sort of submitted willingly to sexual uh, overtures. Now it's a you know closed station uh, room, and those words were taken you know at their face value. Or to take the case of army rapes in areas governed under the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, the army enjoys impunity from various criminal charges. And in 2004 at Manipur in the Northeast, a 34-year-old woman, Manurama Thangjam, was brutally murdered by men of the Assam Rifles, who inflicted horrible injuries on her genitals. In protest, early one morning, 12 elderly women went up to the campsite, stripped themselves in public view, screaming, Indian Army, come rape us, despite this amazing form of public shaming. The situation remains unchanged. Next, the role of dominant political forces which may converge with state power, and Zoya referred to the fate of Muslim women, Gujarat 2002, about which Martha, about which Martha has written so poignantly. <clears throat> they combined torture, rape, and killings of Muslim women and set a pattern, and some of the features of sexual violence in 2002 were repeated in the Nirbhaya, uh, you know, rape, torture, and murder. In such cases, courts are often eventually disabled from punishing the guilty, and violence has disappeared from public memory. Who even remembers little Asifa anymore, the nine-year-old girl who just a few years back was gang raped for three consecutive days in a Kashmir temple and then was strangled. So political and state power overlap and are often fed by the power of dominant social values. And as Zoya said, rapes of Dalit women are rampant and rarely find justice because Dalit Adivasis are perhaps the most objectified of Indian people. Uh, <clears throat> They also carry, the, the women also carry a stigma that they are sexually promiscuous and if they, they are sexually, you know, they enjoy certain sexual liberties, then they are inviting rape and rape is fair and, uh, you know, legitimate. In 1995, I think Bhanwari Devi, a, a lower caste woman social worker in Rajasthan, was gang raped in front of her husband by dominant caste men when she tried to stop the marriage of a nine-month-old girl in the family. When she filed a criminal com complaint, the trial court presumed that an upper caste man could never want to come into intimate contact with a lower caste woman. Rape has been a note for public agitation since the 1890s and fundamentalists were outraged when in 1891 the age of consent was raised to 12 for women. On the other hand, now we have a very high age of consent under which sex with a woman under 18 is considered rape, even if it happens with her full consent. And there are, there's talk of raising this further to 21. This, of course, plays havoc with love and desire among adults, especially when it is interfaith love or intercaste love. So this leads to a different kind of objectification of the woman, rendering her an infant perpetual who cannot possibly know what is good for her, who she can legitimately love, marry, etc. Familial inhibitions also block disclosure of child abuse, especially if it happens within the family, although it would be a very lucky woman indeed who has escaped sexual abuse in her childhood. In India, therefore, uh, as Zoya said, gender vulnerabilities are often framed, I would say almost always framed within a broader structure of socio-political vulnerabilities, religious minoritism, caste, poverty, infancy. Uh, sometimes uh, from certain social classes, men whose women uh, you know, wives or daughters or friends have been violated grotesquely, are themselves sexually humiliated and uh, shamed. And that brings me to my final point. 
Uh, I don't know if the uh, going by Indian cases, Martha's argument that gender abuse flows primarily from pride and greed would entirely hold. Or I should think I should reframe that in a slightly different way. I would say instead that in India, the gap between extremes of power and vulnerability is so wide, so absolute, and the sense of subaltern rights so thin and gestural in practice that it's bound to breed pathological symptoms among those who can exercise power over others with assurances of perfect impunity. So those who have power know that those who don't stand a world apart and they have the need to flex their muscles, their sexual muscles, so to speak, in as pathological a way, as psychopathic a way, as monstrous a way as possible. And as they can think. And sometimes I'm going back to Martha's, uh, you know, uh, earlier point, uh, even the retributive uh, imagination repeats the tropes of, uh, uh, you know, uh, rapist imaginaries. Uh, for instance, after the Nirbhaya case, several websites were set up to discuss how the rapist should be punished. And they were really grisly and grotesque. So there is a, there is a deep flaw in the imagination which is caused by power, control, impunity. And thank you, Martha, for the wonderful book, which I must read again and giving us an opportunity to learn so much from it. You know, this is, it's, it, it was such a fascinating book and this has been such an excellent discussion on it that I, I don't really have very much to add. I'm, I'm so happy that uh, Zoya and Tonika spoke before me because they've already given, I think a very uh, excellent and comprehensive understanding of the differences perhaps in some of the Indian context. But also, you know, Martha, it was, I can't say it was a pleasure to read it because it was a very searing book at many levels, but it was certainly a, a, a book that enhanced my understanding to a great deal. I loved the way you covered the legal processes. And I think we need to look at our Indian legal, the laws specifically in that same, with that same analytical look in terms of what we are perhaps sometimes missing in, in the ways in which we have constructed our laws. It was very comprehensive, of course, but it was also, uh, very thoughtful, I thought, and very nuanced. And as of course one would expect from your work always. So very empathetic. So thank you very much for that privilege of reading it. I tend to agree with Zoya and Tonika that, you know, it's perhaps not pride. Pride is certainly one of the things that determines rape, but it is ultimately really about power as, uh, as Tonika was just defining very explicitly. But, and in many cases, it's not even pride so much as it's it's not an expression of self-confidence so much as it's opposite. You know, in fact, a lack of confidence in dealing with other things and therefore a desire to express power over someone whom you can express power with. So that it's really about confronting those who are weaker than you in a way to take out the frustrations that you are unable to deal with at other levels. Not always, but in many cases. Having said that, there are definitely circumstances, I think Zoya talked about the famous case of the editor uh, but, and many others where it is also pride, the, exactly the same male pride that you have described. And so I think it's a, it's a whole spectrum of these different things. And I suspect that when you were talking about male pride also, you were not really talking only about pride in that, you were not talking about self-confidence, you were talking about the Dante pride, which is a different thing. And, and I, I take that definitely. I think there are other areas where there was a very strong resonance uh, with, with the Indian case. Your, uh, the way you draw the connections between the economic and financial interests of those who protect the violators. I think that's very important in India. That's part, I mean, some of the most stark examples were highlighted already by Zoya and Tanika, but you know, there are, these occur all the time and they occur even in different contexts where uh, it's really business interests in a way that are protecting particular people 
or groups and enabling uh, the, the perpetrators continuously through time. The, uh, the creative people, I loved that chapter. I thought it was so, um, again, so nuanced, but also you know, so detailed in terms of those, those examples that you provided. I can think of similar cases in India, in media, in sports, in entertainment, very, very similar instances. And I think, you know, the thing you describe, that sort of balance between the charisma of the perpetrator and even their ability to captivate us through their art, all of that somehow uh, makes all of us complicit in, in a refusal or a kind of denial about these darker or, you know, abusive aspects of personality. I thought you captured that really well, and I, I know many similar examples in the Indian context, which I think are, are valid and unfortunate and persist. Having said that, there are a couple of areas, I think, where I would take, um, not, not issue exactly, but I would perhaps like to present it slightly differently. You know, there is, you discuss academia, but you kind of suggest, and I think that's possibly true in the American university establishment, I'm not yet familiar enough with it to understand that, that there will be automatic breaks on behavior because of your peers, because of the perceptions around you, because you're in a place for a very long time and, and all of those things. I don't think that's true in India, for sure. I mean, as I said, I can't speak for the US, I don't know, but I, I can tell you it's not true in India. I think in academia and in India, all of the power relations that you describe almost as bad as for the judges and, and in and interns and clerks situation, that there is inordinate power of the uh, of the professoriate, shall we say, vis-a-vis -vis even, you know, the students. And I have seen examples of it among my own students, among my own colleagues. Uh, I think Zoya and Tonika will do about these as well, where it is possible for men to continue to do this because of the power that comes not necessarily formally, but you know, the ability to write recommendations, the ability to create your, for your future in many ways, the ability to pass your thesis, all of these things determine the same sets of power relationships that impact on the ability for different kinds of sexual exploitation. And I think we have cases, we have had cases in our own university of young women who have actually brought complaints and it's always they who have suffered. It's always they who have not finished their degrees and had to leave the university and had gone through various trauma and so on. We've seen similar kinds of processes. I mean, you know, the, the case that uh, Zoya highlighted with Priya Ramani and MJ Akbar, it is a remarkable exception. And we all celebrate it and we thank heavens that that happened. But there are about a hundred other cases where women have not been able to get justice and have actually suffered in their careers, in their personal life and experienced trauma, experienced pushback, experienced you know the destruction of their own reputations, all kinds of things have happened. Given that context, I'm a little less um, willing to uh, to be, I mean I, I understand you know that the need uh, to avoid retributive anger. But I'm more sympathetic to it. I can see why young women feel that even naming and shaming sometimes is better than nothing. There are young women I know personally who have chosen not to file complaints because they've seen what's happened to their friends. And they say, we don't want to go through six years or 10 years of our lives being destroyed. But we don't feel that that person should get away with it entirely. Now, it's true, naming and shaming, I, I completely take the point that there have to be legal processes, they have to, all of those things have to happen. But when you know that it's not going to happen, when you know that instead it's your life that will be destroyed, all you're doing is saying, well, this happened and I'm putting it out there. And nothing happens, in fact, to the people who are named. We don't know the extent to which they're shamed or not. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not, but it's not like anything terrible happens to them. There is a, I think this is, a, this is a more complex issue. Let me put it this way. In a, in a world in which those legal processes don't work in the ways in which they were intended to, where we know that in courts, of course, yes, rapists are told to marry their uh, victims, but 
you know, anybody who brings even these other complaints is basically told what were you, what were you wearing? Why were you out at that time of night? Do you have a boyfriend? Do you drink, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this happens even in the universities where, the, where, where there are these Vishakha judgment type committees, you know, the uh, harassment committees, they, there too, they get that kind of thing because, you know, misogyny, patriarchy exists among a lot of women also, right? It's not confined only to powerful or prideful men. And therefore, I think I, I would see this issue of, you know, the desire for retributive justice. I'm not saying that it works. I agree with you, it doesn't work. But I have more sympathy for it. I understand the context that creates that. And I understand the frustrations and the deep, because, you know, we know that these episodes have deep psychological and emotional impact as well, right, on, on those on the victims. And therefore, I, I accept that it's not productive, but nonetheless, I feel that we need to be more empathetic about the conditions that create that. Uh, so I think that's the only, and I, I know you, you're deeply empathetic. And so I, I think you understand all of this as well. I think therefore that the way we have to address this, of course, we keep fighting the legal battles and you know, thank God there are these amazing women lawyers and feminist lawyers who are sometimes men who are fighting these battles. But we also know that it's very, very uphill and there are many, many, many uh, terrible obstacles in the way and that it causes a lot of pain to those who fight the battles. So I think we have to have a, a broader solidarity with all the different kinds of expression uh, given the complexity of, of this whole issue. Okay, let me, let me stop here. I just want to say thank you though for bringing this up and making us think so deeply about all of these these very important and, and burning issues. Thanks. Well, I'm, I'm so grateful to all of you. Um, I wanted first to say a, a, a little word about my idea of pride. It's not only the people with great social power who can have the vice of pride in my sense. And I think it very often is somebody who in the outside world, in the work world, has no power or influence who then compensates by saying, here in the home, I'm the king. Tanaka has written actually very eloquently about this in, in the Indian context, that that's the, 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 the Raj actually encouraged men to take things out on women because they thought that that would make up for the lack of power in the outside world. So I think it often happens that they say, well, this is one place where I can look down on somebody. I have someone who's there for me. Now, whether it leads to violence or just to exploitation of domestic labor, you know, it varies. But I, I do want to emphasize that it doesn't, it's not just the big shots, but it's all through the, the society. The only thing just to say a word about is, is law. Now, it's not the case that women were, had achieved social power and equality, and then they were able to move the law in their direction. It actually went pretty much the other way around. I think when I started graduate school in 1970, and that's the time when the laws had not yet changed, you know, no one, I mean, I was in the vanguard of women who even went to graduate school. So women did not have much social power. And how were they able then to get it through law? Well, it was a struggle, which I try to describe, but I think there, there are two things. First of all, law is a very prestigious profession that attracts some of the best and brightest people in society. If you asked parents, what do you want your child to be? Either a doctor or a lawyer would be the answers. And I know well that that has not been the case in India, that there are people like Mitu Gulati, who's one of our best law academics, and his parents in Kerala were absolutely appalled that he went from economics to law because they thought that that was a low prestige profession. I blame both Nehru and Ambedkar for that because they really didn't attend to law as an important force. They did not attend to legal education. Ambedkar even said he didn't think upgrading legal education was very important, even though I would say he's the greatest legal mind of the 20th century. And so the result is that actually law does not attract people of great academic prestige. When Zoya and I organized a conference on affirmative action, we were talking about who from the legal Academy could speak at our conference. We couldn't come up with a single person. So we ended up inviting Rajiv Davan, who was a practicing lawyer, but 
It's just that it's not a sphere of academic prestige or creative academic work. I visited a number of law schools and I know that it's largely private law, not even public law at all. And the people don't go there because they really want to do distinguished, critical academic work. Whereas our law school was founded in 1902 by an immigrant who said lawyers have to learn to be critical of the status quo. Therefore, they need a legal education that includes economics, philosophy, and, and it's very interdisciplinary. And that has not happened really in India. <clears throat> the second thing is the age, because our law students start at the age of 22, or maybe much later if they come back after working or, or having children. And they have before that a liberal arts education, which includes a lot of interdisciplinary work. So they come prime. I mean, my feminist philosophy students have already studied gender studies and they've studied this and that. And so then they're more mature and they're more ready to be critical participants in, and, and changers in, in the culture. Now, I don't know, you know what could possibly happen to change that. South Korea has indeed changed legal education from a first degree to a second degree, which requires previous legal uh, um, undergraduate liberal arts education, but I don't see any chance of that happening in, in India. And so it's just a very great disappointment that it, it may happen through the private universities, but I don't really see that happening actually. Um, so you can't turn to law schools for critical legal work and for the training of critical lawyers, the way that Catherine McKinnon, who, you know, she started out as a powerless person and she really got in there just through her legal education. Kamala Harris, she came through law. She got political prominence by being first a very good lawyer and then becoming a district attorney and, and so forth. So law needs, I think it would be great if law in India could be re shape to be a place of progress, of social criticism and social progress. And, and I really don't know how that's going to happen. I was just thinking when you said that, that we do have some actually excellent legal minds who are, you know, thinking about it analytically, but some of them are in jail. Mm, yes. Well, that, I mean, of course, all of that aspect, I totally uh, agree <laughs> with you. And yeah, I'm sure that it obviously, um, if, if Trump had continued in a second term, who knows what would have happened to us. But actually, there's always been a, a threat of this sort in America. I remember when, um, well, there was a, a kind of McCarthyite pressure to fire the dean of our law school. There were people, students actually, including Liz Cheney, who's since then become quite a good person within the Republican party, but she didn't like the Dean because he was too liberal. And she succeeded through her connections to the media in getting him fired. And I thought this was very ominous if that could happen. And I was thinking maybe I would just move. Uh, and I remember the, the, the successor Dean coming to my office saying, well, this might happen in the rest of the university, but it can't happen in our law school. But I didn't trust that. I, I think it can always happen unless everyone is very, very vigilant and, and really just fights all the time. The role of judges here is possibly, you know, uh, somewhat darker than even the worst judges in the United States. In Bangla, in Bengali, we have a saying that if you want to drive out an evil spirit ritually, you cast a handful of mustard seeds. But then the evil spirit goes and sits inside the mustard seeds. So it's like that with us, you know, the judges themselves are so influenced by prevailing perspectives on women and their place and their conduct that, uh, you know, uh, the basic legal norms very often do not apply. Like, you know, saying that a lower caste woman cannot be touched by a self-respecting upper caste man that a judge could say it in a trial court is something amazing, uh, something that flies in the face of all, uh, you know, social realities. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the other problem we have, I don't know if I'm right about this, Zoya and um, 
Jayati, please correct me. Uh, the Vishaka judgment did not bestow more than recommendatory powers to the complaints committee. Uh, so they can go through a case, is that right? Yes, but then the, the, the university or the institution is hmm. bound may to... Or may, not. may or may not, but has to actually address them. In other words, the, they have to the person them. can go to court. After all that, if they don't do anything, then the person can go to court. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very uh, long, prolonged, very, very prolonged, very prolonged process. And in between, as you said, there are various levels where pressure of all sorts is exerted. So, uh, yeah. And Jyoti, I take your point about the Me Too movement. And I think Martha did uh, point out the possibilities. But what I was getting at were degrees of culpability. Sure. No, no, I, that's absolutely true. And also, yeah the degree of the offense as well, right? Which is and finally, sorry, yeah, someone was saying. No, no, I said I agree, the degree of the offense as well, yeah. not to equate all offenses, yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, Martha, finally, uh, legal education, uh, you know, there have been plans to impart it to at village level, at uh, Adibasi level, and so on by feminist legal groups. But the problem is that those who need it most do not have any education at all, nor do they have, as I think Zoya said, the resources to access the law. Or they'll be very lucky if they are in touch with uh, feminist lawyers. They know uh, personally a feminist lawyer to take their case to, and that would all, very often happen only in metropolitan cities. So that's, uh, there's a problem there. I mean, I understand your problem, you know, your point about legal education, but, uh, you know, there are all these impediments or areas of recalcitrance that you talk about. I think we're getting to the close of the end of our time, but Zoya, if you want to say a few words. If you no, I can that. just add to what uh, uh, Joyti and Tanika have said. In fact, I want to really actually add to what uh, Martha said, which is, I think the whole point about the quality of legal education in India is really a very serious one. And you're quite right, Martha, that it's only in the last a uh, decade or so, maybe last 15 years, that, they, that these various no, national law schools were established, about six or eight of them, uh, and some of them private, some of them public. So legal education is a major issue. But I think more than that, uh, as we speak, one of the biggest crises that we face in India today is the crisis of the judiciary and especially of the Supreme Court. So the issue is not how, uh, you know, is not about failure of justice with regard to women, but there's a general failure mm -hmm. of uh, justice in India. In fact, I might just mention a, uh, a rather fantastic article in The Wire uh, today by Gautam Bhatia, and that really sums up the crisis of Indian judiciary. Uh, Gautam Bhatia has written uh, three articles in the last uh, three years, uh, giving an assessment of the legacy of the three uh, outgoing judges, which is, sorry, chief justices, Deepak Mishra, then Akhil Gogoi, and now Tarun, sorry, uh, Tarun Gogoi, and now the, th uh, the one who retired yeah. yesterday, which is uh, Justice Bobre. And his the title of his article today is uh, about Justice Bobde, and his legacy is Mouse Under the Throne. And I think that just sums up uh, the situation of the judiciary. And I think it's very clear that the Supreme Court, uh, Supreme Court is now subordinate to the executive, which is why a number of leading lawyers and advocates like Prashant Bhushan and Gautam Bhatia, and most recently, of course, uh, Dushan Dave and so on, have described the Indian Supreme Court as a, an executive court. So I think the crisis of the Indian judiciary, much like the crisis of many other Indian institutions, but in my view, the greatest crisis facing us really is the crisis of the judiciary. Any uh, Supreme Court which does not for uh, a year and a half find the time to look uh, to examine habeas corpus course, uh, cases. It has done nothing on electoral bonds and nothing on the CAA. 
on the legality, the constitutionality, and the obvious unconstitutionality of the uh, of the Citizenship Amendment Act. I've just mentioned three, and they find time uh, to uh, they they meet sometimes at eight p.m. to provide uh, you know space for. Uh, a, uh, you know, a pro-government uh, journalist. So I think the Indian judiciary is really facing its most serious and most uh, profound crisis. And the most recent was what happened yesterday, which I don't know if uh, I'm sure you've had a chance, but when in the context of this uh, uh, COVID uh, catastrophe, uh, uh, seven high courts were uh, were, were trying to intervene to help in dealing with the oxygen crisis the and various other crises that confront us as we speak. And then suddenly, uh, yesterday, uh, the Chief Justice, along with uh, and his bench, decides to simply uh, uh, appropriate all these uh, seven cases, bring them to uh, the Supreme Court, and believe it or not, the Chief Justice, if I may use this word, uh, Maybe it's too strong, but anyway, he I won't use it. He actually appointed Harish Salve, uh, who's a non-resident Indian who's been living in London for the past five or seven year, five years and is a great favorite of this government. He appoints him as an am, uh, amicus curiae uh, in, in this case. Uh, of course, fortu and fortunately, uh, I think there was so much outrage at this and a lot of very senior lawyers uh, you know, express their uh, uh, their uh, their outrage that uh, Mr. Salve was compelled to recuse uh, himself. So this is the state of the judiciary in India and the state of the Supreme Court. The high courts are, of course, much better, and at least some high courts, certainly like the Bombay High Court, the Allahabad High Court, and so on, have done recently well. But the real crisis, I think, in India today is of the Supreme Court and the media. These are two institutions which are contributing hugely to the perpetuation of whatever the government wants to do. Because people, I mean, there have been several articles in the last two days about chief justices, all of which show that if you look at the record of Justice Bogdé, there's hardly any uh, verdict he has given which is not in favor of the government. And I rest my case here. Thank you. <laughs> Martha, we are well over time, but do you want to make one or two quick concluding remarks? Oh, I, I think I would really just mainly like to thank thank all of you. I guess <clears throat> I'd like to end on the note of thinking about retributive anger. I think Jayati is right that one needs to be empathetic with the, that tendency. But just to talk about Martin Luther King Jr. for a minute, he too understood that retributive anger was better than despair. And when people sat at home in despair, it was better if they were angry and came to his movement. But what he then said is that their anger had to be, he used two words, crystallized and purified, or cha rather channelized and purified. And what he meant was that the part that mainly seeks payback had to be locked off. And the part that wants to confront and move forward and really with outrage and demand, that part would stay. And, and so I think that's really what, what I would like to say, that the part there's a part of anger that's really healthy, namely, you're not gonna sit there, you're gonna demand justice. But the part that says what we mainly wanna do is to destroy that other person, that's not actually much use moving forward. Punishment might be of use, but for other reasons, because it deters and it reforms and it expresses society's values. So I guess I wanna to stick to my guns and say, yes, understand, but purify and channelize. Well, thank you very much. This has been a very absorbing and uh, engaging comparative discussion about sexual assault in the US and, uh, and, and in India and in relationship to the law. Uh, just being here, I learned an enormous amount and benefited from the, from the discussion. It was a great pleasure to host you all uh, in this series. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. and. Uh, Stay well, all of you. So, so take your leave and yeah, thank you again. Oh, I'm Thanks sorry, thank you, Martha, for writing this book. Thank you, Martha, thank you, Martha, for inviting us.